if there's one thing we all know, it's that podcasts are taking over the world. There is nothing better than hopping in your car, throwing on your favorite podcast, and allowing the world to pass you by while listening to your brand new obsession. And there's something for everyone, from true crime to a lovely pyramid-shaped human breaking down the world's worst companies to Joe Rogan? Well, as it turns out, we are doing an episode on Joe Rogan. And that's right. Once comedian turned podcast king Joe Rogan has completely taken the world by storm, unfortunately. And it seems there's no topic too big or too insane for him to forcibly subject his world to. For example, brain chips, exercising, and Hunter Biden's laptop. Those were the hot button topics discussed on the Dynamite three hour episode with Joe Rogan and Mark Zuckerberg in one of the most recent installments of his unhinged podcast. Now, Rogan is no stranger to having these news sources, this is in quotes, news sources, and people respond with heavy criticisms or strong opinions regarding his episodes, but this one seemed a little different. It's a story that just can't seem to stop popping up, Hunter Biden's laptop. Recently, Zuckerberg reanimated this seemingly undying fiasco when he appeared on Joe Rogan's podcast to tell him that the FBI had approached Facebook to tell them that they should be on high alert for misinformation dumps. Only a short time later, at least according to Zuckerberg, the New York Post story of Hunter Biden's laptop hit and was unceremoniously blocked by Facebook fact checkers. And there we go again. According to Zuck, this was a mistake. It's awful when they block something that might be true. Of course, he goes on and on about his issues with the FBI and Joe Rogan just sits back, relaxes and listens. And in the most predictable manner possible, the right-wing media circuit soon exploded with excitement. This was, according to them, a confession that the FBI had actively silenced the story from social media. But that's not what the Zuck said. He said they warned him about general misinformation before the election, not specifically the laptop story. Then there's the fact that evidence has been coming out showing that Steve Bannon had in fact been involved in spreading misinformation on social media regarding the Hunter Biden laptop story. As it turns out, he had teamed up with an exiled Chinese mogul to spread messages far and wide on social media that would harm Biden and strengthen the support of good old Donnie. But hey, you don't have to listen to just me about this. Feel free to check my receipts. It's gonna be source number 26 to make it easy for you. And that's right, source, boom, in the description, numbered and tracked, just for you. With millions of listeners tuning into Joe Rogan's show on the daily and an unwitting willingness from his listeners to hang on to every word he and his guests say to be true, they ran with it. If you're Joe Rogan, that's just how life goes. In the same week that he blew up the news stream regarding the infamous Biden laptop, he also had Aaron Rodgers on his show. In that episode, he let him babble on and on about fake COVID-19 treatments that Rogers started at Joe's insistence, like taking ivermectin. Hearing both of these men who have massive followings discuss their various strategies to avoid COVID-19, make fun of stay-at-home orders and spreading COVID-19 misinformation far and wide is a sight to behold. As they sit laughing and joking about a deadly pandemic, some people cringe while others continue to cheer them on. But this is just the latest of Joe Rogan's controversies. His misleading podcasts and scandalous opinions have landed him in hot water more times than you can count. But he remains on top of the podcast food chain and as he gets more outlandish, he seems to just keep getting more followers. So what happened here? How did Joe Rogan go from being a beloved comedian and one of the best UFC commentators to a white man with a microphone podcaster that seems to cause a stir every other week? Hello everyone and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati and today we're going to be talking about the longtime controversial podcast superstar, Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan wasn't always the podcast icon that we know today. Way back in the 90s, he was just your average comedian trying to make a living. He caught some big breaks when he began appearing on sitcoms like Hardball and News Radio, but soon he found his true calling, forcing people to eat bugs, jump off buildings and touch dangerous animals. In case you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, he used to be the host of Fear Factor. Honestly, we probably should have known something was just a bit off by how damn excited he seemed to get paid to torture people, but you know, hey, you live and learn. His focus soon shifted to becoming a quote, cage fighting commentator, where he made people laugh, scream, and cry at their TVs as their favorite fighters appeared in the octagon of UFC. From sitcoms to eating bugs, to making people laugh, even in the midst of watching others participate in one of the most violent sports in modern history, Joe Rogan quickly became a household name. But soon he would venture where a few at the time had ever gone before. 
the podcast industry. In a time where podcasts were predominantly run by high income, extremely online tech nerds, that's a legitimate quote, Joe Rogan was a welcome change of pace. He came sauntering into the space primarily to create a platform to discuss comedy with other comedians. And that's good, it's in his lane, it's in his style, his vibes, that's awesome. Slowly and surely, everything began to change. It wasn't about comedy anymore. New guests, bigger guests suddenly replaced Dane Cook and Bill Burr. It was about talking to the people that went against the system. Nothing was off limits. And this is where it all started to go downhill because you see, Joe Rogan is extremely open to having anyone and everyone on his podcast. Sometimes that's not so bad. There was one mildly amusing episode where he casually smokes weed with Elon Musk, who's not the best person, but it's still kind of amusing to watch. He even had Bernie Sanders on there. Then another episode where he engaged in a very lengthy conversation with Neil deGrasse Tyson about everything under the sun, literally. One of these topics, ironically considering what we're about to talk about later, is the insanity of people that refuse to believe science. Now, this was in 2019 before becoming a science denier seemed like the cool thing to do during COVID-19. Ironically, Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about how denying science could be detrimental to public health. And even more ironically, Joe Rogan agreed. This seems to be a common thread with Joe, and I don't know if he just wants to relatively agree with everyone who comes on the show, or if it's very, very difficult for him to pin down any type of belief. I'm honestly not sure. Either way, his views and opinions change a lot. He's kind of like a seesaw in the park. He leans with whoever's idea seems to be the strongest at the time, but doesn't actually seem to hold any real opinions of his own. While his wishy-washy stance is already an issue, the biggest problem comes from when he allows guests on his show who are famous for spouting insane and dangerous conspiracy theories, or I don't know, maybe some that have started white supremacy organizations. One of these guests would be Alex Jones, which I'm sure comes as no surprise. He showed up to spout some of the same old bullshit while Joe Rogan asked him if all of the conspiracy theories about politics, particularly anything involving Donald Trump and Russia are just standard shit. Is this standard shit? Is this just stand- how politics have always been done? It's just that now we're seeing it. And you see, that's kind of a problem. Asking a well-known conspiracy theorist who's been banned from pretty much everything, if his conspiracy theories are things that have been going on forever, or they're just now coming to light, that's kind of an issue. It is given notoriety to these ideas, giving a trusted face to them. If you're going to interview someone who's a garbage person, that's fine. But just letting them spew completely unrealistic or untrue things unchecked is a problem. Then there was also Gavin McInnes, and you might know him as the person that actually founded the Proud Boys. Now, according to Joe, McInnes appeared on his show before he founded the Proud Boys, back when he knew him as the founder of Vice. At the time, he says, Gavin was just kind of an asshole who was a relatively good guy who had started Proud Boys as a joke that just somehow magically got away from him. He isn't racist or sexist at all, says Joe Rogan. He was just, quote, using words poorly. He seems to do that whole using words poorly thing pretty much immediately when he was on Joe Rogan's show. When at just 26 minutes in, he says, if you're a real man, you control her and the kids in marriage. He goes on to say that men should be blamed for all divorces because they should have complete control of their wives. And if they got divorced, they just weren't controlling enough. So charming guy. Oh, and in case you're wondering why you may have some trouble finding that episode, this happens to be one of the episodes that was magically pulled from Joe Rogan's collection. I wonder why. But hey, you might be thinking, just because he has these people on his show, it doesn't mean he agrees with them, and you'd also be right. Interviewing someone doesn't automatically mean that you agree with them. But when you don't push back at all, fact check anything, or make any type of disclaimer about the person, even if it's just a short intro, then all you're doing is amplifying their voice. And while he's amplified a decent amount of good and non-harmful voices, he's also lifted up a lot of detrimental ones. Still, it's not just other people's voices on his show that have been an issue for Joe. Through the years, he's found himself in hot water over his own beliefs and actions multiple times. In 2012, Fallon Fox began her career as an MMA fighter. Just one year later, she came out to the world as transgender. For some, this seemed like a monumental step forward. She was the first known transgender woman to make it into professional fighting. And for many, she was seen as a trailblazer and an icon. But with celebration often comes critics too. And Joe Rogan led the way in terms of criticism of Fallon Fox. Prior to coming out, she had fought two other women. No one was seriously injured and nothing insanely different happened that would normally happen in a fight. But still people came in to question whether or not she should be allowed to fight because she was born in a male body. Enter Joe Rogan. He went to his little pretty microphone on his giant podcast and said this. She wants to be able to fight women in MMA. I say no fucking way. I say, if you had a dick at one point in time, you also have all the bone structure that comes with having a dick. You have bigger hands. You have bigger shoulder joints. You're a fucking man. That's a man, okay? 
This coming from anyone is honestly disgusting, but coming from an incredibly famous and influential UFC commentator, this just makes it beyond disappointing. Why, you might ask? Because people certainly followed his lead in this instance. Almost immediately, his fans started attacking Fallon Fox on social media, calling her slurs and repeating the same bullshit from what he said. Eventually, Fox did what pretty much everyone else would do after being hounded by someone else's followers relentlessly and demanded an apology from the comedian. She said, it's been almost a year and I haven't heard a retraction or any kind of public apology. He should do so and that would be really, really nice. But did he actually apologize? No. Instead, he decided to double down and began to launch a string of tweets that claimed that there was clear scientific evidence that transgender athletes have physical advantages over cisgender women. And this, unsurprisingly, came from one single interview with one single physician. Listen, I know this is a sensitive topic and there's still research coming out about it, but there is no question that Rogan calling Fox a fucking man is transphobic as hell. Willfully and arrogantly misgendering someone is always wrong, it always is. But even after Fallon Fox wrote multiple pieces asking for Rogan to apologize or hey, maybe call off his rabbit fans from continuously misgendering and harassing Fox, he didn't. However, a few years later, he did say he wasn't completely right, but you know, before following that up with additional transphobic and misinformed comments. When a new fighter, Alana McLaughlin, made her professional MMA debut, Joe Rogan again felt it was time for him to make his feelings known. This time, he seemed like he was starting to come around a little bit in the beginning. He said his original comments about Fox wasn't valid, but as it turns out, he's perfectly fine, as he says with transgender people fighting in MMA, as long as they let people know they were transgender. And that has its whole other wormhole of problems, but we'll leave that be for a second. According to him, transgender athletes are fine in sports if they let people know, and those people have the ability to refuse going against them. That's all about choice. If athletes don't have a choice to refuse, then that's where the problem arises, and he brings up swimmer Leah Thomas as an example. She had recently found herself in a transphobic media firestorm after she became the first known transgender person to win an NCAA championship. To this, Joe Rogan said, the swimmer that's like lapping all these biological women that's fucked because they don't have a choice, they have to compete. Which by the way, that's also bullshit. Yes, she won, but she also wasn't lapping people. She was nine seconds behind the current record holder for the 500 race, which is Katie Ledecky. So there's that too. The runner up was also only two seconds behind. That's not exactly what I would call lapping, but of course there's more. His comments on transgender people don't just apply to sports either. At one point, he had a writer, Abigail Schreier, on his podcast who wrote a book titled Irreversible Damage, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters. This already raises all of the red flags and multiple scientists and doctors have pointed out the long list of inaccuracies within. But it's Joe Rogan and he'll have anyone on his show. So while she was there, he said that surgeries on kids in particular, because it always seems to be about the kiddos for some reason, were being performed in some sort of a random Dr. Frankenstein sort of way. He continually talks about the idea that there's no science on this issue, which is demonstrably untrue. There is, he just hasn't read it. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist though. But hey, the near constant stream of transphobic comments that he swears aren't transphobic aren't the only thing he's been criticized over the years for. At one point, a video was released that showed all the times he said the N-word during his career. And uh, just newsflash, it was a lot. The 14 year long video compilation showed him saying the N word a total of 24 times. And as if that wasn't bad enough, there was something else sprinkled into that video. At one point, he was telling a story of when he stepped out of a cab in a black neighborhood. He retells the experience by saying, quote, and then we stepped into Planet of the Apes. Don't really feel I need to explain why comparing a predominantly black neighborhood to Planet of the Apes is wrong. His explanation for that wasn't much better either. He says he immediately thought to himself, that's a racist thing to say. Planet of the Apes wasn't even in Africa. I was just saying there's a lot of black people here. Just, (laughs) Joe, Joe. Can I call you Joe? Can I call you Joey boy? Is that cool? That's not better. That's just digging yourself a bigger, messier hole here. But Rogan came out and said he was appalled by himself on the video. He then explained that he would use the word in context, which I don't know why he thinks that's an excuse in his mind. Of course, his apology was littered with a bunch of additional excuses and the claim that this was part of a political hit job on him. He said he regretted the way he spoke, but honestly, the excuses kind of knocked that apology down a lot for me. So I'm not gonna give him a gold star or anything. Maybe he can have just the tiniest little tip of the gold star, the bare minimum, because that's really all he did. And even still, it just doesn't cut it. Joe Rogan's list of issues could honestly go on for days, but that doesn't seem to slow him down. 
In fact, his popularity just continues to grow throughout the years. And that became painstakingly obvious when he signed a $100 million contract with Spotify for exclusivity, which some claim is more like 200 million FYI. From there, he really took off for better or for worse. And it's, of course it's for worse. It's always for worse. When the prospect of Joe Rogan joining the Spotify family was first brought up to its employees, they responded with some reservations. After all, this was the same man that had brought Alex Jones and many other questionable people onto his show, and he himself has said some pretty atrocious things. Only shortly after he was brought on board, an employee group called Spectrum, which includes people who are LGBTQ and allies, pushed back and demanded to know why they would allow someone who had a history of transphobic comments on their platform. But this fact wouldn't be brought to the public until some time later. It just so happened that Rogan's debut on the massive platform was coupled with something else, the rise of the COVID-19 pandemic. Remember when I said that it was ironic that he denounced science deniers with Neil deGrasse Tyson? Well, that's because in 2020, he decided to join that group and become an active spreader of COVID-19 misinformation. The people over at Media Matters took the time to archive every time he promoted COVID-19 misinformation on his show in just 2021 alone. At one point, he said that Alex Jones was completely right in making the claim that the government was attempting to inject microchips into people's arms to see if they had COVID-19. In another episode, he proudly announced that he knew the United States government was, and I'm not kidding, monitoring text messages for misinformation on the vaccines. And where did he get this hard hitting information? Well, from one of the hosts of Breaking Points. Honestly, this list can go on and on and it does. Beyond his rhetoric surrounding the vaccine, he also claimed that wearing masks was apparently just for bitches, it just is. Because somehow protecting yourself or others from a deadly virus is very emasculating for this big strong man. At one point, he even went after lockdowns. On April 28th, he went on his show to announce to the world that lockdowns make things worse. How could this be possible? Well, because people go inside and get trapped inside. And apparently that's how viruses spread, according to him. And I'm just a little confused by his logic, considering that the whole point of lockdown was to be away from people. Quarantine is not a new concept that we suddenly developed for COVID-19. It's existed for pretty much forever. If someone gets sick or there's a possibility that they will get sick, keep them away from everyone. It's not that hard to understand. Yeah, he made one good point when he said lockdowns were bad for your mental health. And there's no denying that isolation is incredibly difficult, but lockdowns being the reason for COVID-19 spreading, that one makes no sense. In fact, according to multiple studies, the lockdowns actually saved a lot of lives. Then came the inevitable moment. He got COVID-19, bound to happen since he didn't believe in masks, vaccines, or the lockdown. We all know the drill. You get COVID-19, you isolate, drink lots of fluids, get some rest, and hopefully you can be okay in a couple days. But that's not the route he went. Instead, he decided to, and of course I quote, throw the kitchen sink at it. Apparently that kitchen sink included taking the drug ivermectin. Of course, he had to tell all of his listeners about the miracle of this drug that the FDA had continuously begged people to stop taking in response to COVID-19. His treatment also included monoclonal antibodies, also known as the rich way to treat COVID-19. This one was probably what was what actually helped him because there's genuine evidence it works, but alas, he told his listeners it was ivermectin. According to him, after three days, he was feeling just wonderful. Given the fact that he has upwards of 11 million listeners an episode, it's no surprise that people would be concerned over his constant spread of misinformation, especially when that misinformation was dangerous to his own listeners and other people's health. Just one year after his arrival to the world of Spotify, he was met with massive pushback. Except this time, it wasn't just the public or the employees of his new best friends. It was massive celebrities and hundreds of scientists. It was everyone versus Joe Rogan. And before we take a look at how the entire world was bullying poor Joey Wogan, we're gonna take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. The best time to prepare for growth is before the opportunity arrives, especially for online businesses. The holiday season is coming up quickly. And if you're not prepared for it, it's absolutely gonna sneak up on you when you are unprepared. So the best tool you have to arm yourself for the busy holiday season is to be prepared. And that's why you should try using ShipStation if you have a small to medium or even large size business. ShipStation doesn't matter if you're starting small or scaling up because ShipStation makes ship happen. There's no more limiting your business to just one store. ShipStation integrates with every platform to include Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify, and more. It makes managing all of your shipping easy from one simple dashboard. One of my favorite parts is of course, how easy it is to compare carriers, rates, and delivery times so that you can get the most out of every single shipment. And there's a ton of companies that already use ShipStation successfully, including Chubby Shorts, Sock Club, Conscious Box, and Saddleback Leather. 
So if you're ready to ship more and grow more with ShipStation, make sure you go to ShipStation.com today and sign up with promo code CASKET for a free 60-day trial. Start today and get set up before the biggest shipping season of the year. Because again, that's two months for free. Visit ShipStation.com, click the microphone at the top and type in code CASKET. HelloFresh is here to make your hectic fall weeknights a little bit easier and a lot more delicious. You can skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. And HelloFresh isn't just for dinner time too. You can shop the HelloFresh market for quick breakfast, wholesome snacks, and even desserts. You'll find everything you need to satisfy your cravings without stepping one foot into the grocery store or mini mart. And you can easily customize your meals with Hello Custom by swapping proteins or sides, upgrading to choice proteins, or even adding a protein to a veggie meal. It's never been easier to eat your way. And by the way, they have recently introduced vegan meal options, which are absolutely delightful. I am so excited because next week in my box, I'm gonna be getting something called plant-based protein messy janes, which are like sloppy joes, but plant-based. And I am super excited to try those out. So if you're ready to get cooking with HelloFresh, make sure to go to hellofresh.com slash casket65 and use code casket65 for 65% off plus free shipping. Again, that's hellofresh.com slash casket65 and use code casket65 for 65% off plus free shipping. On December 31st, 2021, a group of scientists, medical professionals, and professors got together to hit Joe Rogan and Spotify with a massive bombshell, a letter that was begging them to monitor misinformation about COVID-19. In it, they discussed the detrimental impact that Joe Rogan's episodes could have to public health. According to them, the average age of listeners on his show was 24 years old. Coincidentally, according to data, that falls right in line with the age group of people that were an astonishing 12 times more likely to be hospitalized if they remained unvaccinated. With Joe Rogan adamantly pushing against vaccination and even saying that healthy 20 year olds shouldn't worry about it, that is a big issue. The coalition of 300 scientists called this a sociological issue of devastating proportions and begged Spotify to monitor it closely. But it wasn't just scientists. People from all walks of life began popping up to announce their displeasure over the Joe Rogan experience. And soon they were collectively calling for a massive boycott of the platform. Neil Young pulled his music off of their service. Anna DuVernay, who has become massively well-known for her documentaries and groundbreaking docu-series, also decided to sever ties with the service before she was even able to produce her first episode. It seemed like the walls were crashing around Rogan, but Spotify stood by his side after all, and he was by far their biggest earner, and podcasts are clearly the way of the future. They decided instead of just kicking Joe Rogan off the air, they merely would delete a variety of his episodes, Now, some contain content warnings that make listeners aware of misinformation or problematic opinions. They also donated $100 million to marginalized groups. So they did something-ish. Meanwhile, the compilation video of Joe Rogan saying the N-word throughout his career was spreading, making the situation continuously more difficult for his partners. So they stepped in to create a safety advisory council, which would merely be there to offer their insight on topics like hate speech, misinformation, and extremism on the platform. Through it all, Joe Rogan was less than enthused by the criticism of his show and his character. Despite the fact that nearly 88% of his guests and 71% of his listeners were men, he insisted that straight white men are not allowed to talk in a woke world. This was clearly the problem, not the fact that he was consistently spreading harmful information, saying the N word or multiple transphobic comments. It was just the fact that he was a straight white man. Just ignore the fact that he had a $100 million contract for people to hear him speak and a massive audience. Clearly, the voices of straight white men are muffled, so clearly. In his mind, the woke culture has gotten out of control. He sees a world where one day wokeness will lead to straight white men being told, you're not allowed to go outside because so many people were imprisoned for so many years. Again, the man with a $100 million contract who speaks to tens of millions of people on a weekly basis is saying this. Eventually though, he did acknowledge that maybe people shouldn't really be listening to him when it comes to medical advice because, and I quote, I am not a doctor. I am a fucking moron. I am a cage fighting commentator. I am not a respected source of information, even for me. But here's the thing I think he is missing and still does not understand. When you are that famous and have that many listeners, there is kind of some sort of responsibility to be accurate. The people that you have have to be actual experts on your show, or you have to at least fact check the ones that aren't. Regardless of if you're a fucking moron or not, people are going to listen to someone with that type of notoriety. Hence why it's important to watch what you say. It's not woke culture. It's just a general understanding of how the world works. People listen to what people of influence say, 
right or wrong, good or bad, they listen. Despite his assertion that his voice was being muffled out by angry activists, Joe Rogan is still actually doing just fine. Every single one of his episodes gets millions of listeners and he's eventually found himself catapulted into the news once again for his interview with, of course, like we mentioned in the beginning, Mark Zuckerberg. Clearly, he still hasn't quite learned anything. He will keep putting people on his show and saying things without any regard to consequences. Maybe it's time for some changes. But with all of that being said, that is going to be the end of today's episode of The Corporate Casket. Hope you learned something new today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date with all the latest episodes. I really appreciate you tuning into today's episode as per usual. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.